Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining me for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast Forums Edition. I'm your host, Jim Reed, uh, Bluffsterini in the home games. And if you want to find out more about me, you can go to rec.poker slash crew, because that's where everybody on the Rec and Crew uh, has a chance to say a little bit about themselves. Here's another one of those places uh, that the Rec and Crew gets to introduce themselves to Rec Poker Nation. So, gang, why don't you tell them all who you are and where they can reach you? I am John Somsky, and I am Poker Geek MN everywhere. I am Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 everywhere. I'm Tim Fritz, and I'm Miss Click Donkey everywhere. <laughs> and uh, these are the Rec Poker Wizards that I get to hang out with every week and talk poker, all thanks to Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino. Uh, every week we're battling against each other in the nightly home game that's just chips, uh, play money chips as we try and learn and steal from each other and uh, get better together. And every week we take a forum post from the Rec Poker forums and talk about it here on the air. So this week we are looking at a forum post by 5x5, five five, our man uh, Chris Jones, called Here's a Fun One. And I'll just get right into the action here. So Chris is playing in the Sunday Million flight last night. Uh, he's played 248 hands with this villain, which is a pretty good sample size for an MTT, who's playing a 24 VPIP, 22 RFI, 12 three bet. So an aggressive player. Um, I also have potentially relevant note that this player double barrels more than most, especially against big blind defense. So that's a pretty specific note that Chris has taken on this player. Um, Chris is really good at taking notes. And so I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, we, he continues that villain is the table chip leader with 96 big blinds and opens 2.3 big blinds from under the gun. It folds all the way around to us in the big blind. We have 41 big blinds and holding Jack of diamonds, eight of hearts. So why don't we just stop there and talk about what the action is here what does this so we've got this read on our opponent that they're aggressive, that they're aggressive post flop, and that they double barrel most, uh, more often than most. So, what does that inform? How does that inform our play when we're sitting there with 41 big blinds and holding Jack of Diamonds and the Eight of Hearts? What are you guys thinking about in that moment as you're trying to decide how to proceed? It's a race. It's uh, I, I think we just have to defend. You don't, I mean, you're not strong enough to three bet, but you're definitely too strong to fold, even though, you know, you know, you're going to face probably a double barrel. You have a lot of upside to this hand, you know, low, low board. You're probably going to connect, you know, Broadway board. You're going to have a piece. Um, so I mean, I, I would defend. Yeah. Rob. Yeah, I think this is a defend range. If you look at the GTO defend range against a typical GTO under the gun open, I think we we defend with Jack Eight. Um, remember, when you're in the big blind, you're defending really wide against uh, just about any open. Um, not as you're not going to open, you're not going to defend as wide against under the gun, obviously, but you are going to open very or defend very wide against a open so yeah i think this is this is a defend and if we knew that this player was going to be opening wider than usual uh under the gun then i think that would only incline us to defend with this more um i don't think i, I still don't think we choose it as a three bet bluff candidate it's kind of blocking the wrong kind of hands and uh doesn't have a lot of post-flop uh play other than the straightedness so um all right, so I think, and that's how we do play it. We do complete, our, uh, or we do uh, defend and call. And the flop comes queen of hearts, eight of diamonds, two of spades. So we've flopped second pair with uh, the backdoor straight. We check villain bets 1.9 big blinds into a pot of 5.94, which is uh, a smaller bet than the pre-flop raise. So it's a down bet. Uh, now is this, does anyone ever want to lead in this position? Is this just a spot where we're checking for virtually a hundred percent of the time? And then when they do bet, what's the action that we like to take and why? 
Uh, I know I'm I'm going to check here probably 100 um, percent just for the fact we did hit second pair. Mm-hmm. We do have some back doors. At, but if we say we bet, you know, and we go with like a 20 or 25 percent pot sizing, what do you do if you get raised? Then, you know, you, you could have the best hand and just have to fold because how do you, how, you know, then what do you do on the next street? OK. You know, I just got raised. Now what? Yeah, and this player type seems like the type from the description that would be more likely to do that with air. Mm -hmm. So you'd be sacrificing your equity in that particular case. Yeah, I don't think you ever donk bet here. This is not a this is not the type of hand that uh, the solvers would choose to have the big blind donk bet into. So, yeah, I think a check. 100% 100% of the time here. And I think, you know, we've kind of already noted that this player is going to be sea betting aggressively and double barreling aggressively. So I think there's also a sense that, you know, we should understand at this point that if we're calling here, we're likely going to be calling another bet on the turn. So when we're choosing what range of hands we're going to play as a call here, they have to be strong enough to withstand a, a bet on the turn as well. So we kind of expect that to happen at a high frequency. So middle pair too, with a couple of back doors. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, I think another thing you want to think about is what hand, what cards on the turn are you going to be willing to call mm, yep, a double yep. barrel? One step ahead. Uh, because you know, you're not you're gonna be very it's gonna be very difficult to call a Broadway card, for instance. Yes. On the turn. If 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 the turn is a king or a jack, even a ten, that's gonna be a very difficult card to turn or uh, turn card to call. A double barrel. So yeah, we don't mind looking... a jack, but yeah, the kings and the queens, or the kings and uh, kings aces, and we chance. definitely don't want to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, a jack too. I don't know that you really want to. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you have the jack. Yeah, um, that'd be too bare. And then the ten, the, yeah. there, we do have those couple couple back doors in there too that we don't the mind. Ten, but yeah, the ten might not be so bad. But an ace or a king mm. is, is really bad cards for us. Yep. Um. So. And low cards, I guess we don't really mind that much because no. we're still going to have second pair and uh, well, they're still going to be betting some some unpaired Broadway hands. There should be very few low cards in the under-the-gun opening right, range. Right, right. Yeah, so actually, and so since we talk about it, I think, you know, eights, nines, tens, and jacks are all pretty good for us. And... uh even queens aren't bad for us because it kind of makes it less likely that they've got a queen. Right. Yep. And right. Uh, so aces yep. and kings are kind of the worst hands because they're going to be a lot of the hands that this player is bluffing with is going to have aces or kings in it. Correct. Um, but that, that that does incline me to call then because there's really only two ranks that are bad for us and self, several that actually improve our hand and then a bunch that just don't make any change at all and we're already holding the second pair. Right. So. Right. Anything, anything seven or lower is not going to change um, mm-hmm. the strength of our hand versus that range. Right. Right. And then also just to note, um, especially with the sizing that um, they used on the flop, mm. that's that's just like a pretty standard, okay, I'm going to see that here yes. and just try and take it down. You know, yes. It's queen high board. You're in position. You're going to bet. So they should be doing that with a really wide range that we're actually doing pretty well against um, right. when you factor that in. Good point. That's yeah, a one third bet, uh, one third pot bet size, which is yeah. a really standard um, continuation bet mm-hmm. with just about anything that you're going to continue with. All right. So then I think, uh, I think it, it sounds like we all feel like a call is the right play. And we've already kind of thought a bit about what the turn, what turns are we're going to continue with. Um, so we do end up calling Chris calls and the turn is the three of spades. So that's, there's two spades on the board, but other than that, it's a queen eight, two, three. Uh, the villain bets. So we check again, the villain bets 6.6 into a pot of 9.86. So about two thirds which is pretty typical. You're going to see people betting small on the flop and big on the turn. That's a good 
standard default strategy to have. There's a lot of good reasons for that. We won't get into this now, but small bets on the flop and big bets on the turn are a good way to be pulling some chips out of the pool there. We have 36.25 behind and the bet is 6.6. I feel like I'm prime calling here just for the same reason that we've described before. This is one of those cars that doesn't change who's ahead and we've expected them to do this at a higher frequency than they should. We've got the middle of our range that we kind of should be calling with. And even though we don't have the back doors, uh, we've still got that second pair. Um, so if we want to stick to the plan, I think we should probably be calling here. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like just to call. I don't think we're necessarily strong enough to put in a raise, but I, I do like a call because especially with somebody who I already know is probably just going to barrel again anyway, um, no matter their holding. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if it was somebody that I have noted as like a, a tight player, you know, I might be less inclined to call the turn bet, but somebody that I know that's going to barrel twice, I'm probably just going to call, especially we don't have any spades. And mm. so, so they could be on a spade draw at this point. point. Like, okay, you're just barreling your spade draw. Now, if your spades miss on the river, um, you know, depending on the action, I'd probably just call you down. And one thing that we didn't talk about that is uh, interesting about the the six or the other low cards coming is that on the flop, those tens and jacks were good for us because they gave us that uh, backdoor, that that draw equity. But now that the six comes, that's actually gone. So tens and jacks are now bad for us because the opponent could have a ten or a jack. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna be better for their range than it is for us when they're bluffing with the uh, non pair hands. The queen actually blocks some of those, which is nice. And uh, you know we block some of those ourselves, so that's that's nice as well. But uh, so we do call, and the river is the six of diamonds, which is a pretty good card for us. Um, we still have second pair. It's unusual for our opponent to have improved much on this. The pot's 23 big blinds and we have 29 behind. We check. Uh, is there any argument for putting a bet out here or are we going to, that just only allows our opponent to fold their worst hands and continue with their better hands. So I think we, the story that we're telling is best told through a check. What do you think? Now, what we have is a really, what we have is a buff catcher right mm-hmm. now. Right. And mm-hmm. we have some showdown value because we do have middle pair. So, or second pair. So we do not want to give our opponent the opportunity to raise us out of the hand. Mm -hmm. And like you say, um, if you put out a bet here, they could raise as a bluff and we would have to fold. Um, So now I personally would probably be sitting here thinking, well, I'm going to check and call a reasonable bet because I do have a bluff catcher. So um, that would be my gut reaction for how I would approach the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I like that thinking too. And then um, just to add, like I, I usually find myself in these spots. Like if for one, like I'm, I'm only going to lead just to build off that aspect. I'm only leading if I feel like my, hand is worth a half pot bet or better on the river and like you know we basically decided here that our hand is at best like a great bluff catcher Mm -hmm. um and we're playing an aggressive player that we know is going to barrel so we don't want to like rob said get just bluffed off the hand by betting and then leaving ourselves wide open to a you know a, a raise but i also find myself in these spots where if they go just absolutely nuts on the river and it just makes no sense. <laughs> I, you know, I, I do, I do find myself trying to call call in those situations, probably more than what I actually probably should. But um, that that's another thing that I always think about. Cause I'm always like, yeah, I'm a, if it's a reasonable bet, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Three big blinds. I have to call this, you know, you're just trying to steal it. Oh, you jammed. Right. Well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. What does but, that mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
but then you know so you just have to kind of know your player too like if if you're playing a tight a tight player and they go you know three streets of value you're like oh, okay you probably have ace queen here like uh, i'm i'm out of here um so you just the ri- rivers are tr- tricky they're just yep. very very tricky well and they're the hand they're the street we play the least you know, right. we play every hand pre-flop. We play some of them to the flop. Sometimes we get to the turn, and every once in a while, we get to the river. So it's always the street that we have the least experience. So it's it's not unusual for it to be something that we're you know less familiar with. Well, let's see what our friend Jonathan Little has to say about that, and then we'll come on back and wrap this baby up. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a pre-flop raise or three bet instead? All the time. What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? What do you do with Ace King when you miss the flop? Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess, and don't stress. Just register for your free account at PokerCoaching.com slash RecPoker right now. There you go, folks. You heard it here first. I know it's it, this is coming out on Christmas Eve, if memory serves. So ho, 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 maybe it's time for a little Merry Christmas gift to yourself. Head over to rec, uh, pokercoaching.com slash recpoker and uh, try out their discount on uh, Poker Coaching's uh, videos and training stuff and like that. And if you don't like it, uh, Jonathan Little will give you your money back. So just tell him Jim sent you. Head over there to rec, pokercoaching.com slash recpoker. So Merry Christmas, guys. And uh, to everyone in the audience, uh, happy holidays. We got a real present under the tree, this post from uh, Chris. It's been some good conversation so far. So we've check called a couple streets because we had a note on this aggressive player. Now we get to the river. It's a great river for us. It's another brick. And there we have slightly more than a pot-sized bet behind. We check. And as, it, as it's played out, the villain does shove. So they're putting us all in for our tournament life. And the board is queen, eight, two, three, six. We're holding jack eight. And um, Chris, so there's some really good uh, information in the post here. So Chris and Sir Gasleek and uh, Eric Anderson all uh, have a, there's a really good discussion here about the number of combos of value, the number of combos of bluffs. Um, how, what kind of pot odds we're going to be getting, the kind of equity we're going to need to have to continue. So Chris makes a great point. We only need to be right about 35% of the time here. And if our read is right, and this player is going to be triple barreling hands like ace-king, ace-jack, ace-ten, king-jack, then we're actually getting the odds to call here even though they're going to have aces, kings, queens, ace, queen, those kinds of hands. Um, well, here's the thing, though. Do they, do, do the, does the villain play those types of hands this way? Right. I mean, if you've got, say you have pocket queens here, you pretty much have the, you pretty much have the board sewn up. True. There would be no reason to force the person to fold on the river. So you're saying, Rob, we can actually maybe eliminate some combos of their value range because right. their value range would have been played differently. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. I think, I don't, I don't know that you're, are you going to jam with a set here? Right. Why would right. you, I mean, what, what would you hope to gain? You're not, all you're going to do is fold out anything that, that can't continue at all. That's a good point. So what you what she's trying to do is she's trying to fold out the bluff catchers. Mm-hmm. She's not trying to get value with her value hands, and I should said her I'm uh, giving something away already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. To build to build off that, um, just you know, with the queens example, um, having top set on a rainbow board, you're almost never betting that. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you're almost always just supposed to check there and, in a sense, let your opponent catch up a little bit. Um, and then you can, you know, go on the turn and, and the river. But top set is one that you're just usually never betting on the flop. Yeah, so, especially I mean, on those dry is, boards, like you're saying. Yes. Yeah, well, guys. not only that, but you're, you're blocking the continuing range, right? Because mm-hmm. if you have the top set, who, what's going to call you? 
Yeah, a lot but, fewer combos you know, of top pair available to your opponent. Nobody has, yeah, they don't have queens anymore to call you with. So, what are what would you value at value shove here? I mean, what mm-hmm. are the hands that you're doing it with that's not a bluff? Mm-hmm. I mean, I suppose if they had pocket deuces, bottom set would make sense. Yep, pocket eights, but we do block that. That's a good mm-hmm. point. Um, pocket sixes, and you just somehow got lucky to get this far. <laughs> Um, yeah. but Maybe I mean, pocket threes. Yeah, because she could be c betting threes. Uh, yeah, you know, an aggressive c better. Yeah, but yeah, I think that's a good point, John. That's I mean, a good it, point. the only things are the the sets that they'd be betting this way, and not top set because that's a little too strong. You you don't have because if and you're betting a set to target top pair. If you have ace queen, are you playing it that way? That seems a little too strong to be playing ace queen and you're really just unless someone is you really think it's going to call super light yeah, that's the other thing yeah what's your value target with ace queen it's like exactly king queen or queen jack or something like that right so or you that, think someone is going to think you're bluffing and call you with an eight right <laughs> right no seriously seriously I, I mean the way we played this hand um we either have a pair of jacks or lower. Right. Maybe we have a queen uh, or we've paired one of the other uh, uh, an eight in our mm-hmm. hand. That's mm-hmm. kind of exactly what we've, what we're representing. So it's kind of a leveling war between this mystery villain and Chris into, you know, how, that player is trying to, con- to, to contort Chris's continuing range so that using a big sizing like this, he's supposed to be folding a lot of those hands, even though they're the bluff catchers that he needs to continue with when she uses this range. So that's very interesting. And the bet just screams to me, okay, you're going to have to call your, your tournament life. So you better just fold. So right, Rob, right? do you want to, do you want to drop the veil and let the listeners in on who the mystery villain is? Well, what, uh, what um, Chris Continued in the post is to mention that it's an ACR pro Vanessa Cade, mm-hmm. who is known as a very aggressive player. So is Vanessa Cade capable of taking an ace king and jamming it on the river over uh, two calls from a big blind? I, I think yes. I think we I think we all would agree that she is. So uh, I, think, I think so. And when you and when you and when you get to that point with it, it, you know the number of value hands are kind of fixed, and we've we've already talked about how many combos there are. And then the only question is like, how many of these other bluffs are are is this player going to be playing that way? And the more combos we can put in that range to counteract the weight of the value range, the more we're tipping towards calling. I think, and that. And that's another thing that we, you know, kind of should have been thinking about on the flop too, because when we called the flop, we knew we were going to get barreled a lot on the turn. And so that was kind of in the back of our minds when we were thinking about it. And that should be the same thing um, when we get to uh, the turn and think about the river. So have have we kind of, have we Steve Fredlanded this hand by under repping the strength of our hand to the point that now we get to make this hero call? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's his thing. That's uh well, yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think we underrep the strength of our hand because we really don't have that strong of a hand. That's a good point, Rob. We have second pair, right? Uh, what we what we've done is allowed someone to bluff into us with a wide range of hands that may not even include top pair, mm-hmm. or that even beat top pair. Mm-hmm. So. That's really all we've done. We've, we, we have a, like I said, we have a bluff catcher. That's exactly what we have. And so how often is this person bluffing? Yeah. Against an average player, I kind of think this would end up being a fold. Um, but against a very good aggressive player, I think you can make a good argument for a call. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Just because it, there are so few value hands, I, I'd feel better about it if there was a flush draw on the flop. The flush draw didn't come in till the turn, but they could have backdoored the flush draw because you know they did bet the flop. So, 
Well, it was a good conversation. So, spoiler, um, as played. Well, Tim, did you want to jump in there before I pull the uh, curtain back? Yeah, just just to build off that real quick. Like, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, what, just building off of everybody here, what value hands would go for a shove mm-hmm. there? Or even hands that necessarily beat us. I Besides pocket threes, like, I can't find a single one Mm -hmm. because like i'm thinking like okay like you could have jacks here because i would think kings and aces are just gonna try to get it in or bet bigger on the turn maybe maybe even go pot just to try and get called by a queen or for us to jam but like jacks you're not doing that with jacks tens you're not doing that with tens because you have enough showdown value that you're going to beat our eights our sixes you know our our missed flush draws everything that we're not going to call with anyway so i was just sitting here just trying to find a hand besides like a missed draw that does that Mm -hmm. size bet and that's and that's usually like from personal experience what i see the just massive jam on the river over pot it's really like, hey, like, like Rob said, like you're gonna have to call for your tournament life, and if you're right, you're right. But a lot of people are probably just making that fold there, because, uh, like, you know, especially in this tournament, it's the Sunday Million, it's a two fifteen buy in, it's day two, so you know you're in the money, playing for the big money. A lot of people are just, oh, you know, I got second pair here, I'm just gonna fold, move on. And that's what they're trying to get. To, that's what this player is trying to get you to do. Right. Yeah. So as uh, as played, what we ended up happening was uh, Chris held his nose and made the call, and the uh, opponent turned over Ace Ten, and so it was exactly that kind of spot where they felt like they could leverage a fold. It didn't really run out to their favor, and just like we were talking about before. Those aces were bad for us. And then once the uh, turn bricked out, we didn't want to see a 10 either. And uh, that's just, you know, I think it was, and I'm not sure Chris, you know, Chris comes out and says, it kind of depends on um, how you count the combos, that whether it's a good call or not. But given the image of this player and that they were capable of having so many combos of bluffs, he was comfortable calling and, and losing a lot of the time. Don't get me wrong, uh, but winning a lot of the time as well. And having all that money in the pot just makes it makes it worth doing. So nicely done, Chris. Any other uh, thoughts on this hand before we mosey on out of here and get on to putting milk and cookies out for Santa Claus and uh, hanging stockings with care? All I see are smiles and muted uh, muted microphones. So that sounds pretty good. Um, I'm going to send us off with a Christmas carol tonight. This is one of my favorites. Um, of course, I have to thank Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino. But Merry Christmas, Rec Poker Nation. And I hope you enjoy this little ditty by a very familiar voice. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. True patriot love in our sons command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true north strong and free oh he really sells it from far and wide oh canada but he was sitting there with his hands up oh you know, he's really i know it's <laughs> really good god keep our land <laughs> glory Oh, yeah, this video is on YouTube, folks. Oh, Canada, <laughs> we stand on guard for thee. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Merry Christmas to you all, and have a wonderful night. See you next year. <laughs>